Tonight on Four Corners, drugs, murder and political influence. The Italian Mafia alive and flourishing in Australia. The Nrangata has built his reputation on violence in order to keep the intimidation and to keep the fear and to keep the, um, the social control. How corrupt was the system? It was rotten to the core. I can't believe our politicians are so dopey. I find that so extremely difficult to understand how they could be so naive. The Italian Mafia has a long and infamous history in Australia. Remember the Griffith Marijuana Network, the drug lord Robert Trimboli, the murder of anti-drugs campaigner Donald Mackay. That may all seem like ancient history, but what we will show you tonight and again next week is that in the decades since then, the so-called Honoured Society, Andrangheta, headquartered in Calabria in southern Italy, has built a massive operation in Australia, bringing in huge quantities of drugs and infiltrating mainstream Australian politics. Tonight's investigation will take you inside long-running police surveillance operations to dramatically uncover just how brutal, ruthless and deeply embedded the Honoured Society of Andrangheta here really is. We were informed on Thursday that lawyers for one of the principal people featured in tonight's story, Melbourne businessman Tony Madaffrey, would be seeking a court order to stop the program going to air. That didn't eventuate. Reporter Nick McKenzie travelled to Calabria for this joint Four Corners Fairfax Media expose. July 2008, in the heart of Melbourne, a group of men embark on a deadly mission to kill a fellow criminal. They work for one of the most secretive and powerful mafia organisations in the world, unaware that police are watching their every move. We became aware that they were in possession of, uh, of handguns, of firearms. Uh, which gave us rise for concern. Um, and it became very clear to us that they were uh, allegedly embarking on, uh, on a mission to go and, and do someone some significant harm. They were going to kill someone. That was, that's certainly uh, the allegation. Among the conspirators was Frank Madaffrey, a suburban greengrocer with a reputation as a violent underworld figure. Police phone taps recorded him threatening another criminal over a drug deal. Well, certainly he was regarded with a, with a degree of trepidation, with fear, uh, with respect. Um, he was, uh, his reputation for violence obviously had been established. Detective Superintendent Matt Warren and his federal police team had accidentally stumbled across the murder plot as part of a top secret organised crime investigation. They faced a terrible dilemma as they watched events unfold. The police would have to intervene to prevent any killing, but that would force them out of the shadows, blowing many months of painstaking surveillance work. Myself and the team had been living and breathing this, uh, this investigation for months um, and so for, uh, for that to, to come unstuck at that point uh, would have been devastating, really almost heartbreaking uh, for the team and I, really. The would-be hitmen never completed their journey. Yeah, right, I'm getting all this on video. Constantly and so they've attached the um, jumper leads to both vehicles. Their car broke down and they regrouped still unaware that federal police were shadowing them. The surveillance was part of a much bigger operation, which would ultimately expose the Calabrian Mafia's powerful Australian network. It began a year earlier, when police made a massive discovery on Melbourne's docks. Do you have any idea how big the importation would be? Not at all. Um, in fact, um, it was a, a surprise to everyone. As we unpack the container, just the volume of, uh, of drugs we were looking at. Police had uncovered the world's biggest ecstasy shipment. More than four tonnes of the drug, 
hidden in a container of canned tomatoes that arrived from Italy in June 2007. The quantities of drugs were enormous. Uh, the amounts of money that were uh, at stake were enormous. Uh, it, it painted a picture of um, a well-organised group uh, with international connections. None of us expected that we'd be on for the next, um, you know, 13 or 14 months of, of hard slog uh, investigating, you know, an enormous organised crime enterprise. Then uh, you start to see the whole thing coming together. Police focused their surveillance on the man they suspected had brokered the massive drug shipment, Pasquale Pat Barbaro. Police suspected Barbaro was a member of a feared and highly secretive international mafia syndicate known as the Indrangheta, or Honoured Society. Now we've got Pat out wearing the green T-shirt. For months, police secretly filmed Pat Barbaro meeting associates in restaurants, parks and fruit shops in Melbourne, and even at a farm near his hometown of Griffith in western New South Wales. Certainly what we saw with Pat Barbaro was that he was the point man uh, for the Australian end. He was the one uh, who was actively involved in talking to the syndicates overseas, in meeting with them. Of all his criminal associates, it soon became clear that Pat Barbaro treated suburban greengrocer Frank Madaffrey with an unusual degree of respect. One tapped telephone conversation revealed that Frank Madaffrey saw himself as the group's Melbourne boss. I think it shows that, that in his mind, um, he was the number one uh, Andrangheta figure in Melbourne, that, that uh, it was his patch, it was his turf, and that um, whilst Barbaro was able to operate there uh, in relation to what he was doing, it had to be with his permission uh, and with his, uh, his knowledge. So I think, unquestionably, he viewed Melbourne as his patch. As the surveillance continued, other men came into view. This is Frank Madaffrey's elder brother, Tony. Tony Madaffrey is a multi-millionaire businessman who part owns a national chain of pizza restaurants as well as several fruit and vegetable shops around Melbourne. Is it fair to say that Tony Madaffrey was deeply connected to these organised crime figures? Well, certainly he's a very strong associate, absolutely. On a weekend in March 2008, police were watching when Tony Madaffrey met Pat Barbaro and two other drug traffickers in Melbourne's Flagstaff Gardens. It's never been established that Tony Madaffrey is involved in drug trafficking, but his meetings with drug importers aroused police suspicion. Tony Madaffrey appears throughout the court allegations as somebody the group consistently sought to meet with in private Crown Casino or in the villa, the Flagstaff Gardens. What was his role throughout the operation? We would say that, that he was an interested party. Many of the men being tailed by the federal police had begun their careers here, at Melbourne's wholesale fruit and vegetable market. Police discovered some of their targets would meet at the market to have private discussions. They're able to conduct meetings uh, with very little chance of the police being able to intercept those uh, conversations in that very busy market environment. So it allows them uh, a access to other members of the group whereby um, it's, it's mixed in with normal, normal activity. I mean, these people uh, are continuing to run successful farming operations. So um, their attendance at the market may not in fact be on, on any particular occasion criminal, on other occasions it will be. For decades, the Indrangheta controlled the market through a cartel that monopolised the sale of produce through bribery and extortion. Neighbours I have spoken to today tell me that they heard two shots at about 2.30 in the morning. The Indrangheta's secretive market cartel only became public when power struggles within their ranks sparked outbreaks of murder and violence. The explosion occurred just after six o'clock this morning during a busy trading time at the wholesale market. In 1983, the car of the undisputed Melbourne godfather, 
Laborio Benvenuto was bombed in the market car park. When the explosion occurred... It might be the petrol tank. You don't think somebody put a bomb in your no, car? No, because I never got a, no enemy. You've never been involved in any trouble here no, at the market? No, never in my life. Never. A top-secret National Crime Authority report obtained by Four Corners found that the violence was connected with the alleged secret commission and extortion schemes which were operating at the markets. This group was the so-called Honoured Society. Well, that's what they might have called them. I never used that expression and we didn't... Our company never used that expression. We just used the expression, they're a bunch of ruthless merchants. How corrupt was the system? It was rotten to the core. Fruit and vegetable wholesale king Frank Costa saw the cartel in action. What was happening was that they had the buyers of certain products, major lines, big volume, in their pocket. And those buyers would give them the order regardless and it would get through quality control regardless and they would receive weekly, I think it was mostly weekly, it might have been monthly in some cases, but mostly weekly, a brown paper bag. So he might just get 100 boxes of something or whatever and then he'd give him 50 cents a box, 50 bucks at the end of the week. That would grow to 1,000, grow to 2,000. And the guys got hooked, absolutely hooked. And once you're hooked, you're gone. And you sell your soul to the devil, well, you become a devil. In the late 1980s, Frank Costa agreed to a request by the supermarket chains to confront these schemes and end the market cartel. Before long, he received a chilling message from a Calabrian wholesaler. I've been sent to speak to you from so-and-so, who came and approached me this morning in the market with two offers. Your choice, Frank, he said. Um, you can have a million dollars cash now, and it'll be all cash, and you can get that same repeat every 12 months if you let the buying go back to its original uh, process, right? And if you don't want that, you can have the other offer, which is a bullet for you. That was me. How would we could... Frank Costa stood his ground with an audacious bluff. And I said, really? I said, that's very nice of him. I said, you go back and tell that bastard tomorrow and don't soften it at all that if one hair of the head of any of our family is touched in any way, double that will happen to his family immediately. Frank Costa remembers Tony Madaffrey as a key market figure, but says Madaffrey never threatened him. But later, as a new wave of violence erupted at the markets, Tony Madaffrey would face serious accusations at two separate inquests. Of the many startling allegations made during the 10-day inquiry, probably the most shocking was that Tony Madaffrey, a Glen Waverley greengrocer, was the Honoured Society's executioner. In 1991, greengrocer Tony Peluso was killed outside his home in Glen Waverley after a price war with rival grocers. A year later, another fruiterer, Alphonse Muratore, was also shot dead. At the coronial inquests into these unsolved murders, Tony Madaffrey strongly denied claims by witnesses that he was a mafia enforcer. Detective Sergeant Chris Endright told the inquest, police had evidence Mr Paluzzo was threatened by rival businessman Tony Madaffrey a week before the shooting. The threat included a warning that if Paluzzo wasn't careful, he would be killed. His son Giattano Paluzzo heard Madaffrey say, be careful, I'll get you, if you don't, I will kill you. Murder victim Alphonse Muratore's girlfriend told the coroner that Muratore was convinced Tony Madaffrey had killed Peluso. She also said Muratore told her Tony Madaffrey was a man to be greatly feared. I know that in my heart, Fonce is on the stand with me all the time. He's there with me all the time, and I'm speaking for him, and uh, I'm not going to stop speaking for him until the day I die, if it needs to be. I want the truth known. I'm, I really want the truth known. No adverse coronial finding was made against Tony Madaffrey, and he was never charged with any crime. He denied any wrongdoing, telling police he was simply a man who is very respected at the market. 
Tony Madaffery's lawyer dismissed the claims against him as baseless hearsay. He is devastated. He's uh, uh, totally shocked by the allegations that were made. Uh, his family has suffered enormously. His business has suffered. And uh, he is very concerned to attempt to clear his name. In 1995, the National Crime Authority completed the biggest mafia inquiry in decades, codenamed Cerberus. Four Corners has obtained the confidential Cerberus report, which was never publicly released. Antonio Modafferi has been named by three sources as being a member of the Honoured Society. Membership of a secret society must be considered as highly probable. The origins of this secret society lie on the other side of the world. Calabria, at the southern tip of the Italian mainland, is the birthplace and traditional stronghold of one of the world's most feared mafia organisations, the Andrangheta or Honoured Society. Behind the picture postcard scenery is a dark history of violence, fear and secrecy. The Nrangata has built his reputation on violence. It's especially in the 70s, 80s and 90s, so right at the beginning of its empire of drugs, in order to keep the intimidation and to keep the fear and to keep the, the social control. Fighting the Mafia here is a risky business. In order to meet one of the top anti-mafia prosecutors, we are escorted by his armed security detail, who must protect him from assassination around the clock. Roberto De Palma says the Calabrian Mafia has built a powerful base in Australia. Nice to meet you, and you're welcome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, allora, i, I legami tra uh, l'Andrangheta Calabrese e l'Australia uh, sono forti, ma non deve assolutamente meravigliare perché noi troviamo l'andrangheta eh, come una dimensione ormai mondiale. Il flusso migratorio degli italiani in Australia è storicamente un dato assolutamente importante. E quale migliore situazione se non ricreare la Lidl Italy anche in Australia con le medesime dinamiche virtuose, ma anche viziose? The Calabrians entrusted the world's biggest shipment of ecstasy to the Australians, 15 million pills. What does that say about the essence of the relationship? Significa che si, allora, il, la circostanza che sia stato scoperto un carico di estasi così significativo ed importante affidato dai calabresi agli australiani non fa altro che mettere in evidenza che in Australia esiste quantomeno un'organizzazione criminale che professionalmente lavora in maniera ad, adatta e adeguata nel campo degli stupefacenti. At Calabria's container port, Italian police regularly seize massive hauls of cocaine bound for markets in Europe and Australia. But it's just a fraction of the Indrangheta's lucrative global trade. Rappresenta eh, in questo momento eh, la potenza mondiale più importante nell'ambito del traffico della, delle sostanze stupefacenti, soprattutto della cocaina. The birthplace of the Calabrian Mafia is in the foothills of the rugged Aspromonte Mountains. Here, the Mafia remains all-powerful. There is the Code of Honour, meaning that if you, if you break the secrecy code, obviously someone has to do something about you, so if you, yeah, you, you should be killed. Calabrian-born mafia expert Dr. Anna Sergi is our guide as we travel to the tiny mountain village of Apido Mamatina. It's a notorious Ndrangheta stronghold. It's also the ancestral home and birthplace of Frank and Tony Madaffri, the brothers who would later attract so much police attention in Australia. Would Frank Madaffri still have strong connections to the town? Yeah, that's absolutely expected. That's the one thing that has always been clear to the authorities in Italy, in Calabria, in Reggio, is that for the Australian 
organization uh, of Calabrian origin to exist, there has to be an approval from here. You don't have to look far to see evidence of links to Australia. Tony Modafferi left here as a teenager, but Frank stayed behind to establish his criminal reputation. Francesco Modafferi uh, started his career, his criminal career, very young from what we, we see from his record. Um, we see someone involved in violent acts. This is the area where Frank Modafferi was blooded as a young Mafia soldier. Aged just 19, he was caught by police acting as a bagman in a violent extortion scheme. The scheme involved blowing up the house of the victim and demanding a huge payoff. Frank Medaffrey was caught when he came to pick up the cash. The traditional code of silence which has protected the Mafia for centuries remains entrenched here. What happens to informers, those who speak out against the Calabrian Mafia here in these villages? The most common thing that can happen is that someone refuses to pay the protection tax, the racket extortion tax. They attempt to, to send a message across that if you mess with them, if you refuse to pay, then they either burn your shop or they, they make life, life unbearable for your relatives. They make, make it impossible to find a job for your son or daughter. In, some of them have end up, ended up dead. So these rules still apply, but we have less and less um, visibility of killings um, because they, they, they don't need that. I mean, they don't need the publicity. They don't need. They are strong enough without it. They can. There are, are various ways of killing someone. I would say. So it's it's over here where the young girl was taken. Questa è la casa della famiglia mitica, ed è qui che il. 28 di novembre del 1986 venne rapita Angela Mittica. All'epoca era una ragazza di 25 anni. Pantaleoni Sergi is a journalist and former mayor of a nearby town. He takes us to the site of a notorious crime linked to Frank Modafferi, the kidnapping of a local politician's daughter. Cronaca, rapimenti in Calabria, ancora nessuna traccia di Angela Mittica. Angela Mittica's kidnapping became big news in Italy as one of a spate of high profile mafia crimes. We've just been told that Angela Mittica might be willing to talk to us. Now, if she goes on camera, it would be an extraordinarily brave move. Most people here are still terrified about speaking openly about the mafia. At a discreet location, Angela agrees to tell us her story. It's the first time in 28 years she's spoken publicly about her ordeal. I was scared, terribly scared, because I didn't have any idea of what was happening. And then they said, no, it's a rapimento, it's a sequestro, you know, don't worry, there's no other things, nobody wants to do harm, nobody wants to kill. It's a rapimento proprio per Angela Mitica would spend almost five months held captive in a cave hidden among the rugged mountains that surround the town. Her captors wore balaclavas at all times, so she would not be able to identify them. Dunque, le condizioni erano proprio brutte, onestamente, anche perché ero incatenata. E avevo la catena al polso e al, alla caviglia che erano legate a dei tronchi di albero perché praticamente in questa grotta che era, era molto bassa infatti io non potevo stare in piedi in questa grotta c'era soltanto un, una specie, un materasso diciamo di gomma piuma che era appoggiato non su una rete ma proprio su de, delle legna soltanto poi quando venivano appunto loro o me la toglievano ecco un po' di tempo diciamo As the search for Angela Mitica continued, local police arrested more than a dozen suspects. One of them was Frank Modafferi. Why did the police arrest Francesco Modafferi? 
Francesco Madaffari fu arrestato nella prima fase delle indagini, quando più forte era la pressione da parte dei carabinieri, della polizia e dei magistrati perché volevano arrivare a capire e a risolvere questo sequestro di persona. E Francesco Madaffari era già noto alle forze dell'ordine per alcuni precedenti e per questo motivo le indagini si concentrarono su un gruppo omogeneo di cui lui faceva parte. Ripeto, con quale ruolo non si sa, però i carabinieri e la polizia inizialmente pensarono e il magistrato confermò che lui facesse parte proprio della banda che aveva sequestrato Angela Mittica. Pantaleoni Sergi reported on the kidnapping for a major Italian newspaper. So is this where Angela Medica was kept? E dalla grotta che sarà qui nell'area in cui la ragazza era stata tenuta la stavano trasferendo in un'altra in un altro rifugio. Fu, il comando fu incer, intercettato dai carabinieri, nacque un conflitto a fuoco, addirittura stavano per, i carabinieri stavano per sparare alla ragazza, ma lei ha detto no, no, che sono io, che sono Angela Mitica, ecco, e allora l'hanno liberata, l'hanno presa e se la sono portati via. Dopo una prigionia di 130 giorni, la studentessa calabrese Angela Mitica è tornata. After enduring 130 days in captivity, Angela Mitica was finally reunited with her loved ones. Con i suoi carcerieri. Quello penso sia stato il giorno più bello della mia vita, onestamente. Cosa pensavo? Effettivamente, sì, sì. Ho trovato qualcosa di indescrivibile, ecco. Cioè, sapere, ecco, di, di avere... di essermi lasciato alle spalle con quell'esperienza, di essere uscito da quel covo, da quella situazione di vita. Insomma, di poter mi riappro... riappropriare della mia vita, ecco. Può sembrare una stupidaggine, ma proprio... E di potermi fare una doccia, di potermi fare uno shampoo, di poter rivedere le amiche, le, i miei fidanzati, i miei parenti, insomma. Despite his arrest, Italian police were never able to gather enough evidence to charge Frank Madafri over the kidnapping of Angela Mitica. But they did have the evidence to charge him with a litany of other serious crimes throughout the 1980s. He was convicted and sentenced to multiple jail terms for extortion, mafia conspiracy and two separate stabbings, as well as drug and gun possession. He was arrested and sentenced for stabbing. He was also uh, involved in, in a kidnapping case. He was involved in, um, he was suspected of an attempted murder, voluntary attempted murder. And he was, in, he was sentenced twice for extortion. This tells us, uh, considering the area he is from, that he was trying to make a name for, his, for himself. He was trying to show someone that he, he could be trusted to carry out certain work. In 1989, with police again circling him, this time over a prison stabbing and for receiving stolen goods, Frank Madaffri fled Calabria. He arrived in Melbourne, lied about his criminal record and was given a six-month tourist visa. Well, certainly, um, clearly he served an apprenticeship and a fairly violent one uh, in Italy before he came to Australia. Um, there were outstanding warrants for his arrest uh, in Italy when he arrived in Australia, which he didn't declare. In Melbourne, Frank Madaffri began working in the fruit and vegetable trade, where his brother, Tony, was already well established. The violence at the wholesale markets was continuing. Before long, both Frank and Tony Madaffri were at the centre of criminal investigations, with police making explosive allegations in a statement later aired in court and fiercely denied by the pair. Antonio Madaffri has involvement in a substantial number of crimes, including murder, gunshot wounding and arson. Frank Madaffri, if allowed to remain in Australia, will continue to carry out acts of violence on behalf of a criminal syndicate. In 1996, Australian authorities moved to have Frank Madaffri deported after finally discovering he was an illegal migrant with a lengthy record of violent crime back in Italy. How seriously did Philip Braddock was immigration minister at the time. I do have a view that in relation to serious criminal records um, that people may have, that they should be taken into account um, as to whether or not they're able to settle in Australia. And um, my first um, presumption 
is um, we don't take other people's criminals. How seriously... In 2000, Ruddick ruled that Frank Modaffrey should be deported back to Italy. If you have a person who comes and, uh, I think in this matter, uh, marries an Australian and then seeks to stay, um, and there is a serious criminal record, um, in my view, um, that should be taken into account. And uh, the view that I formed uh, was that, uh, um, on the basis of the criminal record, um, he should be deported. Desperate to keep Frank Modaffrey in Australia, his family headed to court. During one hearing, a judge was told that Australian police suspected Frank and his brother Tony were part of a crime family allegedly involved in murder, arson and extortion. The brothers denied this and one judge said the police view could not be relied on as it was based on unnamed informers. But ultimately, the deportation order was upheld and so the Modaffreys embarked on Plan B. By this time, Tony Modaffrey was a wealthy businessman cultivating political links. Among the Modaffrey family supporters were several major political donors, such as Sydney furniture king Nick Scully. Liberal Party sources have confirmed that in October 2001, Scully organised a meeting between Tony Modaffrey and a New South Wales Liberal Party figure associated with a fundraising vehicle called the Millennium Forum. When you look at the Millennium Forum website or the way in which it organises functions, the idea is that you would be a donor of a particular value and that would get you so much access, whether at dinners or fundraising events of different kinds. It's access in return for a donation. It's all about getting the ear of a politician. Exactly, and nothing else. Part of the purpose of the public inquiry will be att to attempt to determine whether or not that innocent explanation should be accepted. As the council assisting the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption, Geoffrey Watson recently investigated the Millennium Forum. On how many occasions would you see it that a donation was quickly followed by a request to meet a politician? Then ask yourself, why is somebody requesting a meeting with a politician? It's not just to get to know them. It's to influence them as to their decision making. Of course, there's a connection. The Liberal Party figure involved in the Millennium Forum arranged a meeting with Immigration Minister Philip Ruddick. Nick Scully arrived at Ruddick's office, accompanied by the Modaffrey's family lawyer, who'd flown up from Melbourne. Were you surprised that a legal representative of the Modaffrey family was sitting in your office? Well, look, I wasn't aware of it. Um, I'd agreed to see a community representative who wanted to put a view. Liberal Party sources have told Four Corners Philip Ruddick was furious when he realised he was hosting Frank and Tony Modaffrey's legal advisor. The meeting was cut short as Ruddick rejected the pleas made on Frank Modaffrey's behalf. Some people wanted to put another view, I was prepared to hear it, but given what I've said to you, uh, criminal records are serious issues um, and uh, I came to a view in exercising my discretion uh, that I would not uh, waive uh, the, uh, uh, the deportation, um, that it should proceed. I'll say this about Philip Ruddick, you may not agree with his politics, but he's a man of integrity. And he acted there as I thought he would and he should. But the fact is that his actions showed that he recognised immediately that there was something wrong with receiving these solicitations from the Modaffreys. I, Amanda Eloise Vanstone, do swear that I will well and truly serve the people of Australia in the Office of Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. In late 2003, Amanda Vanstone replaced Philip Ruddick as Immigration Minister. Tony Modaffrey now called on the help of another prominent businessman and political donor to lobby the new minister to have Frank Modaffrey's impending deportation overturned. The donor they turned to was Pasquale Pat Sergi. Pat Sergi is a property developer with a reputation for charity work. In 1979, the Woodward Royal Commission concluded he'd been buying and selling real estate using money provided by Mafia drug traffickers. Woodward found that it was uh, essentially a money laundering operation. It was quite substantial and certainly by today's standards, we're talking millions and millions of dollars. 
What does that say about Pat Sergi's closeness to the Mafia? Well, they wouldn't have been giving Pat Sergi cash and allowing him to invest it unless he's an extremely trusted person. The Modaffrey brothers and their supporters launched a full-blown political lobbying campaign. Pat Sergi approached New South Wales Liberal Senator Maurice Payne. Other donors lobbied Victorian Liberal MP Russell Broadbent, as well as his colleague Bruce Bilson. In the lead-up to the 2004 election, Tony Modaffrey organised a political fundraiser in Melbourne, attended by all three Liberal parliamentarians. Each of them had previously contacted Immigration Minister Amanda Vanstone about the impending deportation. The guest speaker at the fundraiser was Amanda Vanstone. On the evening, Tony Modaffrey personally donated $15,000 to the Liberal Party's Millennium Forum. This is a case study of what's wrong with the system. What's seriously wrong? Uh, the point is that for no better reason, for no better reason than the making of donations to a political party, specific representations were able to be put to amongst the most powerful politicians in the land. Access which you and I couldn't get, except if we made substantial donations ourselves. By 2004, Tony Modaffrey was a regular at Liberal Party fundraisers, including this function with then Victorian opposition leader and now Melbourne Lord Mayor, Robert Doyle. Searching through hundreds of photos from fundraising events, Four Corners discovered Tony Modaffrey even meeting then Prime Minister John Howard. In November 2005, after a year spent lobbying, Frank Modaffrey finally got the break he was looking for. Amanda Vanstone intervened in the case and overturned the deportation order. Amanda Vanstone has not responded to repeated attempts to contact her and all the MPs involved in the lobbying declined to be interviewed. But they've maintained their intervention in the case was based on humanitarian concerns about the impact of the deportation on Frank Modaffrey's family. Why did you feel it? In a Senior officials who worked on the Modaffrey visa case have told Four Corners the decision to overturn Ruddock's deportation order was appalling as it exposed the community to harm. Do you stand by your decision that you made as minister in the Francesco Modaffrey case? Look, I wouldn't be here talking to you if I didn't um, believe um, that weighing up all of the issues that were before me at that time that it was the appropriate decision. Should Frank Modaffrey have been given a visa? Well, that's not really a question for me to answer. Um, however, on the basis of, uh, of the fact that he had significant criminal convictions, uh, certainly he's not someone that, that we would recommend would be given a visa to, to reside in Australia, for sure. Four Corners can reveal that a secret multi-agency police report found the Modaffrey visa case highlighted the insidious ways the Mafia enter the social or professional world of public officials and through legitimate processes achieve influence. There is no suggestion that Vanstone acted corruptly, rather that members of the Italian community, including Andrangheta members and their families and associates, are likely to have ingratiated themselves with her office and that through their legitimate public face were capable of achieving influence. The Calabrian Mafia doesn't give anything away. Any cent they spend uh, is because they expect two cents back. Now, in this case, what they were doing were making an investment in political connections to, to try and build up pressure to have it overturned. After winning his battle to stay in Australia, Frank Modaffrey embarked on the boldest chapter yet in his criminal career. In 2007, he was under fresh investigation, this time for his links to the world's biggest ecstasy importation. Police were listening in as he threatened his underworld rivals. <laughs> No Detective Superintendent Matt Warren was convinced that Frank Modaffrey was part of the syndicate responsible for the massive ecstasy shipment. But catching him and his accomplices would not be easy and would involve a high-stakes cat-and-mouse game between police 
and one of the most dangerous mafia groups in the world. Senator Maurice Payne and MP Bruce Bilson declined to be interviewed for the program. Senator Payne said in a statement that when she made representations to the then Immigration Minister in relation to Frank Modaffrey, she had no knowledge of the criminal associations of any party she dealt with. Bruce Bilson told us he was deceived about Modaffrey's criminal background and was quote-unquote bitterly disappointed about it. Amanda Vanstone and Russell Broadbent did not reply to our requests for comment. Next week, we'll bring you part two of this important expose, which reveals the inside story on the world's biggest ecstasy bust, the next crop of mafia leaders in Australia, and Frank Modaffrey's labour connection. We'll leave you with a taste of what's to come. Until next Monday, good night. The Calabrian Mafia in Australia is the longest running crime organisation we've ever had. A new generation of godfathers. Organised crime figures will try and cultivate people of all walks of life, but particularly people with influence. The links are there, the links are tight and they are based on blood ties. And how they're taking care of business in Australia. These groups are very difficult to defeat. They regroup, they rebound, they reorganise and they'll continue to because it's their business. Four Corners, next Monday.